Hello everyone, my name is Allison Mail, and I am the manager of the Urban Barcode Research Program. And I'm Louise Bott, manager of the Urban Barcode Project. Welcome to the 2019-2020 Urban Barcode Symposium keynote address. This symposium is the culmination of a year's work on the Urban Barcode Project and Urban Barcode Research Program. Before we move on, I want to acknowledge that student projects this year and in fact, all of our lives have been disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is why we're hosting the symposium virtually for the first time instead of in person. The last few weeks have also been particularly difficult for many. Protesters here in New York City, across the country and around the world are expressing pain and anger at recent killings of Black Americans and centuries of racism and oppression against Blacks, Black people. We at Urban Barcode stand with those who seek justice. If you haven't already, I encourage you to check out dnabarcoding101.org. Student posters for all three of our DNA LC barcoding programs are available for viewing on the website. We are always proud of the teams that complete these programs. And this year we are especially impressed with how hard teams worked despite the disruption brought on by the pandemic. Teams analyzed data and created posters through virtual collaboration all while adjusting to school from home and work from home. Some teams had samples that were locked away in schools or labs that they were no longer able to access. And many of those teams shifted their projects to analyze existing data, which is no easy task. Students and mentors, we hope that you are proud of all you have accomplished this year. We are certainly proud of you. For teams that were unable to finish your projects, we completely understand the situation you were in, and we support you should you wish to resume your projects at a later date when it is safe to do so. We also thank the parents and families of the participants in these programs. Your support is essential and appreciated. We are always thrilled to see so many students take an interest in scientific research. DNA barcoding has roots at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. In 2003, a group of scientists met at the CSHL Banbury Center to come up with a standard set of DNA barcodes that could be used to identify species, much like a UPC code identifies items at the supermarket. It turns out that DNA barcoding is a great way to identify species and has been used by scientists worldwide to identify products in the marketplace, correct mislabeled foods and natural health products, improve environmental monitoring, monitoring and measure environmental impacts of human activities. Students who participate in DNA barcoding projects contribute to science in a meaningful and impactful way. The Urban Barcode Research Program is part of the New York City Science Research Mentoring Consortium. We are grateful to other members of this wonderful consortium for their support, discussions, and advice. The consortium has been particularly helpful as we adjusted to the realities of schools and research institutions being closed and transitioning to providing online programming. Support for the New York City Science Research Mentoring Consortium and the Urban Barcode Research Program is generally, generously provided by the Pinkerton Foundation. UBRP is also supported by Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. The Urban Barcode Project is currently supported by the Thompson Family Foundation. We thank all of these foundations for their support of our student research programs. And we also want to thank everyone at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory DNA Learning Center, in particular, our Executive Director, Dave Miklos, our other New York City staff, Jenny Hackett and Melissa Lee, and Sharon Pepinella, who manages Barcode Long Island. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Louise. Thank you, Allison, for that wonderful introduction of our barcoding programs. Uh, this year, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker. Dr. Corey Moreau is the Marth N. and John C. Moser Professor of Arthropod Biosystematics and Biodiversity at Cornell University in the Departments of Entomology and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology in Ithaca, New York. She is also the Director and Curator of the Cornell University Insect Collection with over 7 million specimens. Dr. Moreau earned her PhD in Evolutionary Biology from Harvard University and was a Miller Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. Before this, before this, she completed her undergraduate and master's degrees at San Francisco State University. 
Dr. Moreau was elected a Triple AS Fellow in 2018, a Kavli Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences in 2016, a National Geographic Explorer in 2014, and highlighted as a woman of impact by the National Geographic Society in 2018. Dr. Moreau's research on evolution and diversification of ants and their symbiotic bacteria leverages molecular and genomic tools to address the origin of species and how co-evolved systems benefit both partners. Also, she pursues questions on the role of biogeography and symbiosis in shaping macroevolutionary processes to better understand broad scale evolutionary patterns of life. In addition to her passion for scientific research, Dr. Moreau is also engaged with efforts to promote science communication and increase diversity in the sciences. I had the opportunity to hear Dr. Moreau speak in Brooklyn in 2017, and I remember her talk vividly. I knew as soon as she agreed to present our keynote that she would give an engaging and inspiring talk to you all today. We encourage your participation in the chat box during the talk. You can access that by making sure that you watch this stream on YouTube. Please post your questions as you have them. And at the end of the talk, we'll have some time to ask them. Without further ado, Dr. Corey Moreau, how I became a rainforest explorer, ant genomes to microbiomes. Great, thank you so much for inviting me and it's wonderful to be here. Um, I, I'm really excited uh, for you guys to be able, been able to participate in this program. It's unfortunate that we've all gone remote working for a while, but hopefully it's still been a really uh, um, engaging and fun experience for you. Uh, I believe strongly in sort of getting people exposed to science, and uh, I am excited that you guys are getting this opportunity so early in your careers. So I thought I'd share a little bit about sort of my background and how I became a scientist since before I jump into some of the research I do. So I didn't actually know any scientists growing up. That's actually my picture from kindergarten. And it's among one of my earliest memories. And it's because I remember that morning having an argument with my mom because my mom had been promising to sew my favorite butterfly patch on my jumper. And that day was picture day. And I said, but mom, I have to have the butterfly for my picture day. And my mom said, Corey, they're gonna take a picture from here up. They won't even see the butterfly. And I begged and pleaded. So she finally quickly stitched it on my romper. And I remember back then you had to wait a while till you got your pictures from school and I got my pictures. And I think that was the first time I ever felt like justice because there was my butterfly so clearly prominent in my picture from kindergarten. So I already had a love for nature at that age, but I didn't know any real scientists. The science I knew was from watching things on PBS and on, you know, television programs, but I still did, you know, sort of try to understand the natural world around me. I put out cookie crumbs anytime I could to watch ants. I went out and tried to pretend like I was, you know, capturing the behavior of birds in my neighborhood. And although I didn't realize it at the time, that was being a scientist. Scientists are actually engaged in asking questions and are curious and observing the world around them. So I also wanted to share a little bit about how I sort of got to be where I am. It was a very nice introduction with all of these accolades and awards that I've won in my path to my scientific career, but it's not that I came from all of that. My parents did not graduate from college and I didn't know any scientists growing up. I didn't actually really know what a scientist did before I went to college other than the things I'd seen on TV shows. So I knew that there were forensic scientists who solved crimes and I knew that there were explorers that I saw in these programs, but I sort of thought they really only needed the ones that we'd seen on TV, that there was probably not a lot of opportunity for a kid like me. I grew up in Louisiana and not only did my parents not go to college, um, no one in my family had even ever gotten a PhD. But the one thing I did know is I wanted to study biology. I loved knowing about the natural world. So, you know, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I was in love with nature. But unlike, probably like many people, when I got to be a teenager, I sort of felt the societal pressures that it wasn't cool for girls to like bugs or science or math. And although I still continued to get really good grades in those classes, I didn't sort of express it as openly that that's where my passion was. 
But luckily for me, I still went off to university, to college, and I got to be able to study biology. And it was there that I had my eyes open to all the ways that you could sort of use a career in biology to ask lots of compelling questions. And I was really fortunate to work with some amazing scientists during my PhD. Um, I worked with Dr. Nomi Pierce, who's a specialist on butterflies and symbiosis. I walked with, worked with Dr. E.O. Wilson, who is a specialist in ants and a champion for conservation and many other things. And I worked with Dr. Scott Edwards, who's a remarkable scientist who's well-skilled in using DNA for population genetics and genomics and actually studies birds. So I've told you that I've had this lifelong love of, of insects and it was always the ants that captured my attention. And I think it wasn't just the fact that, you know, I could sort of, you know, see them in, in nature, because I could see lots of other organisms in nature. It was that I could actually watch them behaving. I could put out cookie crumbs and have them come out to pick up the cookie crumbs and carry it back to their nest. I could watch them wage battles. I could watch them try to navigate carrying a very clumsy item back to the nest. So I think it was the fact that I could actually watch them in real time that piqued my attention. And then once I got down close enough, I started to notice that there weren't just one or two kinds of ants. There were many kinds of ants. And not only did they differ in their behaviors, but they differed in their sort of overall form and functions. And so you can see just a few examples of some of the diversity of ants here. But ants are an incredibly rich group of organisms to study in biology. I sometimes get asked, why would I focus so narrowly just on ants? But it turns out that ants have more species than all the birds and mammals added together. So now thinking about that diversity, it allows us to ask lots of questions about how sort of forms have evolved and what their role in the environment is or their ecology. Interestingly, ants are also a female dominated society. So what do I mean by that? Well, almost every ant you've ever seen in your life is female. The females do all the work in the nest. They're the ones that are foraging for food. They're the ones that are waging the battles. They're the ones that are building the nest. Males are only produced about once a year and they have wings as well as do the new um, unfertilized females that are gonna go on to become queens. And males actually offer no help to the nest. They never gather food. They never dig the colony um, chambers. They never are going out and waging war. So if you've seen an ant without wings, it's female. And ants have a lot of really cool things that they do. We often think that we're the first to achieve things, but it turns out in the insect world, I can guarantee you there's an insect that's done almost everything we think we've done first, except maybe travel to the moon. Um, and in fact, ants are among the world's first farmers. So if any of you have ever seen videos of these, or if you've been fortunate enough to travel to places from Mexico south into South America, these are the leaf cutter ants. And what you have are individuals with really strong jaws that climb up to the top of the canopy to cut down little bits of leaves. And then they carry them over their heads like this and almost like a parasol or an umbrella. And they carry them back to the nest and then they mulch them up into this. So what this is, is this is the food. This is mulched up and becomes the food for this. And this is a fungus or a mushroom. And it turns out that the ants aren't actually eating the leaves themselves. They're using the leaves to grow their food, which is the fungus. So they've been farming their own food for about 50 million years. In addition, ants can be used for medical um, situations. So these are army ants. And what's really unique about army ants is they have some of the strongest dimorphism. And what that means is that these two individuals are sisters and these two individuals are sisters of two different species of army ants. And what we have here is that these sisters are responsible, the small ones, for going out and sort of doing most of the activities for the nest while these soldiers act as defense. And these very long mandibles, they almost look like the tusks of an elephant. And those are used to deter prey, um, to, to deter predators and capture prey. And they, they're incredibly strong jaws, but in fact, they're so highly modified, they can't even feed themselves anymore. And they actually rely on their sisters to feed them. But the way in which these ants have been used for medical um, uses is actually if you were to wound yourself in the forest, you can actually use those powerful jaws to clip closed as, as like stitches or suture wherever you've had that injury. And so what you see from this National Geographic article is here's an individual who had a wound. They're using the ants to clamp closed that wound. And then you're watching that wound heal through time 
where eventually all you have is the head capsule and then the jaws are sort of embedded in the skin. And eventually you can sort of pull those out once your wound is healed. So why did I tell you all those fun facts about ants? Well, one is because clearly I love ants and I could tell you another hour and a half's worth of fun facts about ants. But actually one of the things that I think makes ants really fun to study is where they're found. So what you're looking at here is a map of the world and it has to do with the species diversity. So the warmer parts of the map, the reds and pinks and, and oranges um, are where there are more species of ants. It's where they sort of exist on the planet. And the cooler parts of the map are where we have less species of ants. And so what you'll notice is almost all the ant diversity is centered around the equator here. And that's the tropical regions of the world. So it's probably not surprising to know that ants like many insects have their highest diversity and abundance in the tropics. And what's great about that is that means that I get to travel the world sampling these ants. So everywhere there's a star is a place that I have been to collect ants. And what's amazing about going to these places is not just seeing the ants, which I love, but it's seeing all the other wildlife. It's seeing what forests around the world look like. It's getting to interact with scientists from all of these places, not just while you're there, but for years to come as your collaborators. And tropical field work is really fun. Um, I've been able to do it on all parts of the world. I've even taken my entire research team to Costa Rica where we did a bunch of experiments together, which is really fun. This was a particularly fun example of being able to sample in the canopy. So that little spot there is me. I look like a little spider among a web of cables where essentially I can drive myself around with a remote control to collect ants from all the tops of the canopies. Now, of course, tropical field work is lots of fun. Uh, it does come with consequences. Every now and then you'll get an intestinal something that makes your tummy upset. But I think the funniest example I have is actually this. This in this tube right here is a tick that I inadvertently smuggled home in my nose from Uganda. So despite the fact that it's really fun, sometimes there can be some downsides. So why is it so important to study biodiversity? I've essentially told you that there's lots of kinds of ants and all kinds of you know, organisms around the globe that you know, traveling to these beautiful rainforests is really fun to be able to observe nature as it is. Unfortunately, this is what's happening across most of the globe. That many places, the richest biodiversity is being converted for human use sometimes for agriculture, sometimes for cities. Um, and it's not that we necessarily should point the finger at other people. We in fact do it ourselves here in the United States, but in places we have the glo highest global biodiversity, we really need to be thoughtful that to make sure that we're ensuring that that diversity continues. And in fact, if any of you are fans of E.O. Wilson, you'll know that he's put forward this idea of the half earth where we should be protecting at least 50% of the planet for the natural world. And I think that's an outstanding idea. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through two different kinds of questions that I've asked in my research and that people in my lab continue to address. And first has to do with sort of the evolution and sort of biogeographic distribution of ants on the, flower, on the planet, thinking about their interactions with flowering plants. So, it's interesting that we would think about ants interacting with angiosperms or flowering plants because unlike bees that go around pollinating plants or butterflies, ants actually don't pollinate plants. So thinking about why they might have this interaction is a little bit um, complicated. But there have been some reasons to think from the ants point of view why it's beneficial to take advantage of this beautiful habitat. One of which is we know some ants actually live entirely in the canopy. And we also know that lots of ants have transitioned from being predatory to then having plant-based diets, which is almost entirely reliant on these flowering plants. But ants are still beneficial to plants. Um, there are a whole group of plants that rely entirely on ants to disperse their seeds. So what you're seeing here is a seed, and this little piece on the seed is called an eliosome. It's sort of a fatty body that's produced specifically by the plant to attract ants. So what happens is the plant drops its seeds, then ants come around and see this delicious little fatty body, pick up the seed, carry it away closer to their nest, chew off the fatty body, and then throw the seed away. And the reason that this is important is it's essentially ending up in seed dispersal for the plants. So now the parental plant that's been shedding all the seeds doesn't have competition with its own young or its own saplings. 
And this is so important in plants that over 11,000 plant species rely on ants to disperse their seeds. And it's evolved independently at least 100 times across the plants. So there is this sort of reciprocal interaction between ants and plants. So to try to tease this apart, the very first thing I had to do was to infer a family tree for ants. So just like you've been doing with your DNA barcoding, it's a very similar technique where we go in and we sequence bits of the genome to try to figure out who's related to who. And just like you've been able to see that using DNA barcoding is powerful to help you identify a species, we also know we can use it to sort of build family trees or to know how networks of species are related to one another. Now, when we published our work, most of the research that was published, um, uh, most of the stories about our research that were published were completely accurate. This one was not, in fact. And what's interesting is they said that we had analyzed the DNA of fossilized ants trapped in amber. Now, I wish we had that Jurassic Park-like technology where we could go into a fossil and pull a little bit of ant DNA out and then build a giant ant. No, I'm just kidding. But I do wish we could use the fossils in that way so that we would really know where do those fossil species sit in the sort of evolutionary family tree of ants. But we do have other techniques to incorporate them. So what we did is once we had that family tree of ants, we went in and looked at the fossil record. We actually looked at actual ant fossils ourselves. We also looked at the fossil literature and felt comfortable because we wanted to be highly conservative. And lucky for us, there are thousands of ant fossils that we could use 43 as minimum calibration points. Now, what that means is if we have a group of ants and we know that a fossil belongs somewhere in that group, we can say that that group is at least as old as that fossil and it's probably older. And then we can use some analytical techniques and some statistics to help us inform on how old the ants in fact are. And what's great about these fossils is not just that we have a large number, 43, it's they're scattered across the entire ant phylogeny. They're not just stuck in one little pocket. In addition, those fossils range in age as young as 15 million years and the oldest at 100 million years. So it sort of gives us this window into ant evolution. Now, once we conduct those statistical tests and analyses, we can put an age on the ants. And the ants are probably around 140 to 168 million years old. Now that's interesting to people like me, but maybe not as interesting to everyone, but it did allow us to contextualize sort of how did the ants evolve? So when I looked at this dated phylogeny or evolutionary tree, I noticed that many of the branches where they sort of split sat in a very distinct part of the tree. There weren't that many to the tips, and that weren't that many deep in time. So I began to wonder what could explain this. So we actually also had to use some statistics to make sure that that was true, because it turns out the human eye is really good at seeing patterns, even when they're not there. So what you're looking at here is called a lineage through time plot. And all that means is that we're looking at time from the present through 250 million years ago. Then we're looking at how those branching events increase through time. And you can see that whether we look at it in this sort of sheer numbers or whether we bin them into this histogram, we can see that right around 100 million years, something happened. They started to sort of increase in numbers quite quickly. And we teamed up with some botanists and we were able to demonstrate that that completely corresponds with the sort of rise and dominance of the flowering plants. If we paste over our ant phylogeny where botanists believe that the flowering plant forest expanded, it almost completely corresponds with both where we see it on the family tree, but even on that lineage through time plot, suggesting that really the flowering plants had a huge impact on the evolution of ants. But we wanted to take it one step further because we know that you know, ant diversity, as I already mentioned, is centered around the tropics. And we know that flowering plant diversity is centered around the tropics. Think of all those lush rainforests you often see when you see pictures of the tropics. So this begged the question, are the ants just sort of following the flowering plants as they move across the globe? Now, I've already talked to you about the fact that ants and many other groups of organisms have their highest diversity around the tropics. And that's called the latitudinal gradient in species richness. And all that means is that we see most species around the tropics and we decrease as we go towards the poles. And the fact that we see many groups having this pattern suggests that there's some mechanisms that may explain it. 
So to test these hypotheses, we had to infer an even larger ant family tree. So we can include even more information about where ants are found on the planet. Now there have been some hypotheses to explain that latitudinal gradient in species richness or why we have more species in the tropics. And the first was sort of put forward by Stebbins where he said, maybe the reason we see more species in the tropics is it's acting like a cradle. So a cradle is exactly what you imagine. It's in reference to babies. And what he's essentially saying is maybe that's just where new life is evolving more frequently. So essentially in the tropical regions, you have more species arising more quickly. So you through time, you would just accumulate more species in the tropics. But on the flip side, maybe the tropics are acting as a museum where you're sort of holding the ancient life and it's persisting longer, meaning that maybe species are arising equally across the globe, but extinction is so high in the non-tropical regions because the tropical regions have been so stable and persistent through time, it's allowed those sort of older lineages to exist there. So through time, because of extinction in these sort of temperate regions, the tropics would just end up with more species. So this was really great because it set out some expectations or some hypotheses we could test. We can ask the question, is the tropics just acting like a species pump where just more species are being generated so quickly that we end up with more species there? Or are the tropics acting as a museum where the oldest parts of the phylogeny or the evolutionary tree are persisting and that we really only see new species arising both in the tropics but also in the temperate regions? So how do we incorporate that information? Well, since ants are distributed globally, the first thing we needed to do to determine how we were gonna sort of bin the sort of global diversity. And many biologists have long recognized these six biogeographic regions because they have very interesting patterns about biological diversity. So what we had to do is this is just a subset of the list. We had to take every single species that was in our phylogeny and then mark whether it was present in one of those regions or in multiple of those regions. Well, interestingly, if you know anything about these regions, you know that they haven't been in their current configuration through all of history. So we also need to incorporate time. So what do I mean by that? Let's imagine we have a species that's currently found in South America, but we want to understand what's the probability that it could migrate to Africa. Well, more than 100 million years ago, the answer is 100%. It absolutely could just walk straight across because those land masses were completely touching. But as those land masses drifted apart through time, we needed to decrease the migration probability between those regions till eventually we get to our current configuration of where those are. In addition, other regions that were completely non-connected in the past, think of India colliding with Asia, we had to account for the fact that those species should now be able to migrate easily back and forth between one another, but maybe historically couldn't through time. So take into account not just the presence absence of where these species are, but the probability that they can migrate based on evolutionary time allowed us to sort of infer the sort of ancient biogeographic ranges of these species. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that almost every pie on this family tree is green. And that's the neotropical region. And so interestingly, what it looks like is that the neotropics are incredibly important sort of for deep time evolutionary history of the ants. Now, I couldn't put all the pies on the tree because it'd be very dis, you know, disconcerting to look at. But we in fact did examine that as well as the fact that we can take something about what we know about ant biology. And currently the neotropics hold more species and unique endemic genera than any other region of the world. Now, interestingly, when we went back and compared when did ants arrive in these different biogeographic regions with what we know about flowering plant um, biogeography, we don't find that the ants are just tracking right behind the ants. I mean, the ants aren't tracking right behind the plants. So it doesn't appear that, that the angiosperms had to be there. What we actually hypothesize in the fossil records suggests is that ants were actually pretty globally already distributed at this time, but they were in pretty low abundance. They didn't seem to be sort of the ecological champions that they are today. But when the flowering and plant forests arrived, they really increased in our numbers. Now, if we go back to those hypotheses that have been put forward to explain that latitudinal gradient in species richness, what it appears for ants is that the neotropics have acted both as a museum, it's where we see almost all the oldest lineages, as well as a cradle, because it's where we have the current largest number of species for ant diversity. 
So now let's think about why the expansion of these flowering plant forests would have such an impact on ants. If we go back to thinking about what did the sort of earliest ant look like? We know that it was ground nesting, we know it was ground foraging, and it was predatory. And when the flowering plant forest came along, it provided this whole new dimensional structure for them to forage in, to look for pre prey items, and even to feed on. And what we see is that many ants moved up into the canopy to sort of begin to build their nests. There were lots more prey items available to them. And in addition, they began to feed on plants both directly but also indirectly like these sap sucking insects that produce honeydew droplets for ants themselves. So really it's this sort of interaction with plants and other animals that allowed them to sort of become the, you know, uh, ecologically and numerically dominant group of organisms they are today. So I think that transitions nicely with thinking about the role of bacteria in, in the evolution of herbivory. I sort of like to joke that this is how vegetarian ants could sort of get enough nutrients from their diet by using gut bacteria. So gut microbes of ants are a really great case to ask questions about bacteria and hosts in general. And that's because we can ask the question of how does diet influence the um, interaction with ants and their, um, their microbes? Not only in the sense that we can manipulate their diets in real time in the laboratory and then see how their gut communities respond, but in addition, we know that things like herbivory have evolved independently multiple times. So we can ask the question, do ants just use the same bacteria every time they become herbivorous? Do they always need bacteria if they become herbivorous? We can ask questions about transmission. How are microbes transmitted among individuals, both in sort of real time within a colony so we can introduce pathogens and watch how they spread. We can try to understand if some individuals are sort of a hub and they're gonna be big transmitters thinking about our current state of COVID-19, that's a really interesting idea, versus where other individuals, if they've socially distanced, right, they will not be hubs for, for microbial transmission. But we also can ask the question about how microbes are transmitted through sort of longer periods of time. Do we have individuals that, because of their intimate ecological interactions, they're more likely to have similar microbial communities? We can also ask the question that once these microbes become members of the hosts, do they actually sort of consistently evolve with their hosts, sort of tracking the evolutionary of their hosts, leading to what we call uh, co-diversification? Or do we end up in a situation where the, the family trees of the host and the bacteria look nothing like one another? And we can actually make predictions about when we expect to see those different patterns. And since ants are found across the globe, we can ask the question, where are they acquiring these microbes? Are they acquiring from the local environment? Are they acquiring them from the interactions they have? And so this is why we love to look at ants and their gut microbes. So when I first started this project with my long-term collaborator, Jacob Russell at Drexel University, um, I sort of joked that I felt like one of those early rainforest explorers that you read the tales of where they just ran through and they grabbed this bird and then they grabbed that monkey and they grabbed that plant and then they saw this weird mushroom and don't forget the ants because really what we were doing is just trying to figure out what was there. Almost nobody had looked at the bacteria living inside of ants. We've now also started to look at the fungi inside of ants and the parasites like nematodes inside of ants and viruses. But at that point, we didn't know a lot about what was living inside of ants. So what we did is we took a large number of individuals, almost 400 individual ants from across 150 ant genera and just said, what's there? Now, you're probably not surprised to learn there was a lot. But what really jumped out to us is that this group of bacteria was in high abundance across lots of different ants. So why was that interesting to us? So any of you who know a little bit about plant biology might be familiar with this group of bacteria because it in includes the rhizobia. So what you're looking at here are the roots of legumes, right, the beans. And these little nodules are these little structures that are produced specifically by the plants to hold these symbiotic bacteria. And in return for living inside of these little nodules, the plants give the bacteria carbohydrates. And in return, the bacteria fix atmospheric nitrogen and provide resources in the form of essential amino acids to the plants. So that's why many legume plants can live in really nutrient poor soils because they don't need to acquire these nutrients from the soil, 
they have bacteria that help do that for them. And since the bacteria are just relying on the natural abundance of nitrogen in the air they, and fixing it that way, it's a really amazing symbiotic system. So it begs the question, why are we finding a group of related bacteria inside the guts of ants? Are they performing a similar role? Well, we had another key piece of the um, puzzle that made us believe that maybe these bacteria are involved in a nutritional symbiosis. So what you're looking at here is this is just the trophic ecology or the food web of ants. So things at this end are highly predatory. These are the army ants. And things at this end are herbivorous and things in the middle are omnivorous. And what we use is this uh, really nice tool called stable isotopes where we look at the ratio of heavy to light nitrogen as it accumulates up the food chain. And we could ground truth that by including known predators and known herbivores. Now what we've mapped on this um, on the y-axis is whether they have an association with that group of bacteria. And every one of those diamonds is an ant genus and its isotopic signature, so where it sits on that food web, um, with multiple individuals from that genus and lots of species. And what you'll notice right away is that we only have an association with that group of bacteria when they feed low on the trophic scale, right? So we only see that herbivores are associated with rhizobiales. So it's another sort of line of indirect evidence that maybe they are in fact responsible for upregulating the hosts or the ants nutrition. But if you have a keen eye, you might've noticed that there's two points or dots on this graph that feed very low on the trophic scale, but do not have an association with this group of bacteria. And it turns out that those are the carpenter ants and their relatives. And we already know that these group of, these group of ants actually have a co-evolved specialized group of bacteria that sits in a specialized cell within the ants that upregulates the host nutrition. And that bacteria is called blockmania. So it appears that if you're gonna feed very low on the trophic scale, you need an association with some kind of bacteria. Now, we also wanted to understand if these bacteria are in fact involved in sort of upregulating nutrition, they need to be in the right part of the digestive tract, right? So what we did is we wanted to control for any bacteria that are found in the environment. So we sampled all the bacteria on a leg. So now we're not targeting one individual um, bacterium. We're actually using a DNA barcoding tool, but for bacteria. And we're asking what are all the bacteria on this particular tissue, in this case, a leg. We also look at all the bacteria that get introduced to the digestive tract, but maybe do not move beyond the mouth cavity by dissecting out the mouth cavity. Then we actually looked at three distinct regions of the gut. And what you're looking at here is a cutout of a gut that I've actually dissected. First is the crop, and that's the social stomach of an ant. So you've probably seen ants running around, you know, drinking up liquid food stores sources on the ground and then running back to their nest. Well, the crop acts as a storage cavity, just like in birds, it's the same idea. It's also called a crop in birds. It's just a, a sort of a chamber to hold so, you know, some kind of a food so that it can be regurgitated to other members of the nest. So we know no digestion happens in the crop. Now, once we move into the mid gut and the hind gut, we actually expect that, that we know that that's where digestion occurs. So we would expect that if it's bacteria are, are important for the digestion of the ants, this is where we would see the most abundant and the most conserved bacterial communities. Because we wouldn't expect to see the transient bacteria that just got picked up by whatever they touched or whatever they ate. So what you're looking at here are pie graphs and this is only a subset of them, but all I want you to take away and we can just look across the top panel is that different tissues have different bacterial communities. And that's really suggestive that maybe in fact, what we see is that there could be an important role for bacteria. Now, another way to look at this is through what's called a PCOA plot. So all this is telling us is that the more similar the entire bacterial community is, the more similar those dots will be in location. So all the samples that came from the leg, the mouth and the crop have no pattern, suggesting that there's just random bacteria that we're picking up. But once we move into the hindgut and the midgut, suddenly those bacterial communities, even though they're from individuals that are very geographically distributed, their bacterial communities look very, very similar. And this in fact suggests that yes, and these bacteria are upregulating the host nutrition. 
Now we've since done, I'll just back up for a second, and since done a few different experiments that we've been able to um, experimentally demonstrate that the bacteria inside the guts of these ants are in fact upregulating the host nutrition, but not in the same way as in the plants. They aren't fixing atmospheric nitrogen. They're actually taking resources in the body cavity of the ant and turning those into essential amino acids for the host. But when we started the study, I sort of had a, I already had sort of predicted what we'd expect to find. I thought, well, we've looked at this herbivore and we know a little bit about other herbivores. So I expect that what we're gonna see is that the bacterial communities of herbivores look more similar to one another than to generalists and to predators. So we could said, we, we can actually test that. So we took a whole bunch of these different herbivores and each one of these pies shows us all the bacteria we see inside those, those guts of those individuals. And we compared it to another genus of ants. In this case, these ants are all more closely related to each other, yet the herbivore gut community looks more similar to a very distantly related herbivore than even to other species it's more closely related to that has a generalized diet. Now I can tell you that as a, 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 a supervisor of students, this is where I made my fatal flaw. I then went on to say, I already can predict what a predator's gut community is gonna look like. It's simple, it's not very interesting, they probably don't need gut bacteria. Now I can guarantee you that I should have known that that was gonna fly in my face because of course it did. So when we sequenced a whole bunch of the bacteria inside the guts of this ant, it's called Paraponera clavata, which is also known as the bullet ant. What you'll notice is that their bacterial communities look wildly different than everything else. They have so many different kinds of bacteria in there. And in fact, these three individuals are from the same nest and they don't even look very similar to one another. So then I realized I actually had not been wearing my very thoughtful biologist hat that day. And there's a couple of things I did wrong with that study. One of which, although Paraponera clavata is a predator and will take down living prey items, you know, usually other insects, it will also take advantage of some plant-based resources if they happen to wander past them. In addition, unlike army ants, which are sort of these group hunters, bullet ants actually each go off in a different direction. They're solitary hunters unless they find a really good resource, then they will recruit other individuals back. So then I thought, huh, I wonder if this is like us. So let's imagine if it was not in COVID time, we were all in the same you know, big uh, conference room and we had had lunch together and maybe we we're gonna have dinner together. If you would have sampled our gut communities yesterday because we'd all been in our different worlds, some of you that maybe live in the same house or participating in the same program may have similar gut communities, both from your interactions, but also from the contaminants on your food. But then if you were to sample us all after dinner tonight, suddenly our bacterial communities would look really alike because we're all ingesting the same food, both with its contaminants, most of which are not harmful for us, but also that our own bacterial communities respond to what we're in fact eating. Some bacteria love sugar, so they bloom when we eat a lot of sugar, where others prefer, prefer protein sources. So I thought, well, we can go back and retest this question. So what I did is I took my entire lab down to Costa Rica. We sampled a whole bunch of these ants again. And this time what we did is we actually sampled ants right away so we could look at what their wild caught community bacterial communities look like, right? Like the last study. But then we actually took some back to the lab and fed them on an artificial diet for multiple weeks to see what happens. So we had multiple colonies from all over Costa Rica that we had caught wild and then some, then we brought them back to the lab and then we actually changed their diets. Now, the way that I'm gonna present these data is through what's called a network-based analysis and I'll explain what we mean. So again, we're using that bacterial DNA barcode so that we're not looking at one bacterium, we're looking at all the bacteria in that particular sample. So all those guts that we've dissected out. The individual circles represent an ant sample and they're colored either red because they were from a wild caught individual or they're colored yellow because they're from our diet manipulation experiment. And that encapsulates all the bacteria from inside that individual ant. Now, if there's an edge or a line with no connection, it means it, it's a unique bacteria to that group. And the length of those edges or those connections tells us something about how similar or dissimilar they are. The way I like to think about it is this. If they're highly similar, 
the bacterial communities in two or three different or four different samples, they're like magnets, they're attracted to one another. If the bacterial communities are very different from one another, they're sort of repelled or pushed away from one another. So what did we find? This is the results. So you'll notice right away that all the red dots are sort of widely distributed across this sort of space, suggesting that they had a lot of differences among them, just like we saw down here. Now, once we fed them on those diets, I mean, we controlled for what they were eating, suddenly their bacterial communities become highly similar, suggesting that maybe they do in fact have a few microbes that are necessary for them, but they don't have the vast diversity we'd seen before. And one of the things I really like about this example is it's a situation in which you can start with one scientific question and then get the results, which then informs the next scientific question in a question. And in fact, I could keep going on because this study has now inspired some additional ways I would want to do these experiments. So hopefully I've been able to convince you that, you know, sort of not just documenting biodiversity, but sort of being champions of preserving biodiversity are incredibly important. And I hope that there's at least a few of you that are watching that have now gotten inspired to study ants. Um, there are hundreds of ant scientists, but with you know, nearly, you know, we have 15,000 species known to science and there's at least double or triple of that. We need all the ant scientists we can get. So if you're interested in sort of pursuing that career, I would highly encourage it. And that I think what's really great about being a biologist is that the kinds of projects you can do can vary from being entirely field-based to being entirely laboratory-based or somewhere in between. And I've tried to sort of take my career and sort of go from field to lab and back and forth because I actually enjoy both. What I've been able to show you today is that ants are an old group that likely um, diversified in response to the rise of the flowering plants and they've had very intimate interactions with the flowering plants. And that the tropics and especially the neotropics are incredibly important for ant evolution. So if we're gonna think about conservation of ants, we really need to protect the neotropical forests. And for those ants that have shifted onto an herbivorous diet and taken advantage of these beautiful forests, they often rely on an additional symbiotic relationship with a group of bacteria in their guts to help them get enough nutrients from this plant-based resource. So hopefully you're all considering a career now in biodiversity science. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, and for me, it's been really fun because ants have taken me around the world to study the ecology and evolution of ants. And so I couldn't think of a more rewarding career. So why did I tell you all of this? Um, can all of you become scientists? The answer is actually yes. If that is what you're interested in, absolutely every one of you can become a scientist. And is it worth it? For me, absolutely. I couldn't imagine a career that I would enjoy more. And that's even coming from a place where I didn't know any scientists. So the other great thing about being a scientist is you almost never do anything alone. So I've had many fabulous collaborators on the work that I've presented today. And now I'm fortunate enough to head up my own team of scientists. So all of the members of my lab are, I sort of consider my closest and most fun colleagues to interact with. And I'm also fortunate to be married to a chemist who I also collaborate with. So I think it's a really rewarding career. And if you're all interested, please let me know. And I'd be happy to take questions if there's any. Thank you so much, Dr. Moreau. What a wonderful talk. Um, I think we do have a couple minutes for questions and I see that we've got some questions coming in. If you haven't had a chance to ask your question yet, there's still a couple minutes, so feel free to put them in the YouTube chat now. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start uh, with a question that came in while you were talking about the microbiome studies. Um, someone asked if these studies were primarily done in those ants found in the tropics, and if you, ha if you found anything in other studies that shows the ant microbes vary in different climates? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, interestingly, not all those studies were done in the tropics. I've worked in lots of places that are not in the tropics too. You give me any chance to go outside and I will do it. Um, but interestingly, what we do find is that the most stable and persistent gut communities almost always come from herbivores. Now, of course there are herbivore species found across the globe but there's the most number of sort of uh, 
obligate herbivores, meaning that they won't take in a ins dead insect here or there in the tropical regions. And some of it I think is about availability. If we think about, if you relied only on plants when you were living outside, I live in upstate New York, you guys live in New York, there's not a lot of trees or plants with a you know, material available. So what we see is that you have to have that food available year round. So it just turns out there's more herbivores in the tropics. But there are herbivorous species here in the U.S. that completely rely on gut bacteria as well. Great question. All right. I think our next question from the YouTube chat is, does the host physiology have impact on the microbial communities in ant? Oh, that's a great question. And it's one that in ants, we're only sort of starting to understand and lots of other larger organisms that are easier to manipulate, we know a lot more about it. But of course, there's the situation where it's not just where you're found in the body, but it also has to do with things like pH, right? And resources available for the microbes to grow themselves. So we're just starting to understand how in lots of insects, pH can actually mediate the, the digestion of food in a ways that sometimes means you do require bacteria and some means that you actually don't rely on bacteria at all, that you can actually use your own physiology to sort of process food. So there's a little interaction of both. All right. Um, we have a question about the sister ants that you showed earlier. Um, somebody asked if there's any genetic differences uh, or some other factor that makes them so different? That is a really interesting question. And it's actually one that uh, one of the members of my lab is trying to address because what's really cool about ants and bees and lots of other social insects in the Hymenoptera, the ants, bees, and wasps is that all of those sisters are so highly genetically related that how do you take essentially the same DNA but make such extreme different forms, right? So some are these giant soldiers with giant mandibles where others are these tiny little small workers that not only look different, but behave different. So how do you take the same DNA and end up with different forms? And it appears that a lot of it probably has to do with regulation and hormones. And a lot of those hormones are actually even driven by um, resources while you're developing. So how much food you were given as a larva. So thinking about even with us, we know that the better your diet is when you're young, the higher probability you are to be able to sort of fulfill all of your forms. We actually believe in many cases that those small workers are kind of starved um, uh, individuals that during development, they were actually not given, you know, the large number of resources as the soldiers were. That's super cool. Um, so somebody asked a question about um, the relationship between the ranges where ants live and climate change. Are those ranges changing because of climate change? Do we know? That's an interesting question. Um, we've done uh, one study which hasn't been published yet where we've actually been trying to understand exactly that question. So what we're essentially doing is mapping all of the known distributions of ants currently in this case, we're looking at North America because we have the largest number of records. So we have, you know, close to 100,000 records of ants across the Canada, the US and Mexico. And we're asking the question, which climate variables predict where they are? Um, and then what happens if we use some of the predictive modeling about what people expect with even conservative scenarios of climate change? And of course, what we see is that the projection is that ants are going to move northward pretty dramatically. But the downside of that is that we know that most ants actually live in small populations in very isolated regions. So could they keep up with the rate of change that's predicted with climate change? And most of those predictions are no. So in those cases, those populations or species will actually go locally extinct, which means extinct for them. In addition, we've been doing some modeling to ask the question, well, what happens with invasive species? And interestingly there, of course, they're gonna con continue to expand their distributions, but they'll definitely keep up with the rate of climate change. And in many cases, we know that those invasive species have really terrible impacts for native species. So even for the native species who can persist through time, these invasive species might actually still lead to the um, extinction of many species. Yeah, invasions are, are crazy. <laughs> um, okay, we have kind of a fun question next. 
Uh, what's your favorite place you've traveled for oh, work wow. or for science? <laughs> that is a really great question. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could pick one. I will say that the South American Amazonian rainforest is one of my favorite places to be in the world. And it doesn't matter which country I'm in. I just love that everywhere you look, there's something that you didn't expect to see, whether it's some poison arrow frog or a species of ants I'd only ever read about, or whether it's these beautiful morpho butterflies, or whether it's little tamarind monkeys running around the trees. I mean, it's just unbelievable to sort of see all of that diversity. Really cool. Um, yeah, I, I haven't traveled that much for my work and it sounds like a really uh, a missed opportunity <laughs> for my job. Um, so uh, one more question from our YouTube chat, which is, are there differences between, uh, uh, are there differences in the bacterial load between different locations of the ant gut? Oh, that's a great question. Um, in fact, yes. So we can use what's called quantitative PCR or qPCR to ask the question exactly how many bacteria are there, not just the identity. And remember, we were looking across that digestive tract. What we see is that within the, the crop, we see, even though there are a lot of species of bacteria there, they're all in really low abundance. They're essentially just contamination from whatever they ate last. Once we move into the mid gut, suddenly that bacterial load or the number of, of bacteria there goes up tremendously. You end up with, you know, sometimes on the average of 10 to 100 times more bacteria than we see in the crop. And that persists throughout the rest of the digestive cavity. So suggesting that it's not just the um, identity of the bacteria there, it's also the density of the bacteria there that are important for upregulating the host's nutrition. These are really sophisticated questions. I'm impressed. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we're gonna wrap it up with one last question. Um, it's what advice would you give to students who are interested in becoming an ant scientist just like you? Oh, that couldn't make me happier. Um, I'm first gonna address the question more broadly and I'm gonna say that you should always follow your passion because if you're not passionate about what you're doing every day, it's hard to sort of feel motivated to keep going especially in science, because a lot of times in science, the answer turns out to be, uh, you know, and you might've had a great hypothesis and then you test it and you're like, I was kind of wrong and the answer is not as interesting, but that can spur the next question, right? And so I think if you're not passionate about what you do, whether it's in biology or not, it's really hard to sort of feel dedicated and, and creative and curious every day. If you wanna become an ant biologist, um, there's lots of ways to do that. If you have a natural history museum near you or a university near you, reach out and see if there's someone there that knows something about ants. Um, it's a great opportunity to start getting exposure to what kind of things we do with ant science. Um, if you reach out and they don't have anyone, you could ask if they know anyone because I guarantee you there's somebody nearby doing work that you could shadow them in their lab or at least go and meet them and see what they do. Um, there's, of course, tons of great books available and resources online. Um, and, you know, eventually when you get to that point that you're confident about it, please email me and we can talk about your career in myrmecology. All right. I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, Allison, do you want to give everybody the, the closing thought? Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, so thank you all so much for joining us today. If you are, and thank you, Dr. Moreau, for being here with us and sharing your amazing story and really interesting research with us. Um, if you are watching this live and you are one of our barcoding teams, please go to your posters now. If you have an odd number poster, you should be answering questions until six o'clock. If you are an even number poster, you should start answering questions at six o'clock until 630. So everyone, I hope you have a great night and thank you again for being here.